Good morning, everybody. Winter slowly arrives in Munich, so perhaps next week there's already some snow. <laughs> I don't hope so, but yeah, <laughs> it looks like this. Um, welcome to Mixed Signal Electronics. Today we continue the switch capacitor chapter that we have started last week. I hope you had some time to go through this and to remember a little bit what we did. So the basic idea was that we want to get rid of ohmic resistors in a circuit. The reason was mainly the high variability of these devices and also the difficulty to implement uh, resistors with a uh, high uh, resistor value in a small uh, silicon area. So therefore we had a structure like this. We used a capacitor and a set of switches. And what we did is to open and close these switches alternately in a way that at no time both switches are conducting. So the cap is either connected to this input port or to the output port here. So we are pumping charge from one node to the other. So we charge the cap to the one node, then we separate it from that node, then we connect it to the other node, and then a charge balancing occurs with the cap that is connected here or whatever is connected here. And therefore we transfer charge from here to here. Of course, this is a discrete process. It's not continuous that you s might say there is a continuous current flowing from this node to this node. It's more or less a peak of current that occurs when we close one of the switches. But if we look only at discrete time instances, the effect is that in an interval t corresponding to the period of opening and closing these switches one time, during that period we transfer a certain charge. So in average, this corresponds to a constant current that also flows in this time. And then we saw that a structure like this can be represented by an equivalent resistance. So what I want to do now is to take a very important building block in analog electronics, which is the integrator. And the integrator is a building block that is very often used in filters. It is also used in data converters, such as the sigma delta converter. And hence it makes sense to analyze this important circuit uh, also with respect to a switch capacitor implementation. The basic circuit of a single-ended integrator is that we connect a resistor R to the inverting input of an op amp. And in the feedback branch, we have a capacitor C. So this is the continuous RC implementation. And then we have a voltage drop here, which is the input voltage V1. At this node we have a virtual ground so the complete voltage V1 drops across this resistor and we have here a current flowing V1 over R. So then this current flows through the resistor it cannot enter the op amp because here in the operational amplifier in CMOS technology we have very high input impedance. This is because here we connect only m gates of MOS transistors to this node. So <coughs> the current cannot flow into the op amp, so it has to flow completely through this cap. So here in this cap we also have the same current, V1 over R. So the voltage drop across the cap is resistance of the cap, complex resistance, times this current. So we have V1 over SC is the resistance of this device 
and here this R. And our output voltage here, V2, is equal to the negative value of this voltage. Negative value, well, because here we count it in this direction. If we close the loop for the output voltage, then we go in the other direction here. So we have V2 equal to minus V1 over SRC. And then we can compute the complex transfer function H depending on S or also H depending on J omega which is equal to minus S sorry minus 1 over S R C or in terms of omega we can say this is minus 1 over S equal to J omega over omega zero and omega zero is then defined as one over R C. So the absolute value of this is given by one over omega R C and for the argument of H. You can see here we have a minus sign. Here we have a J. So if we expand this by J, then we get in the numerator a J. And here we get J square, which is a minus one. And this minus one cancels with this minus one. So what we have is a J. And in the argument, this corresponds to uh, pi over 2. Good. So, to approach uh, the switch cap circuit, we have to remove this resistor and to replace it with, uh, um, with a switch capacitor equivalent. So first I take all the parts that don't have to be replaced, which is the operational amplifier, here with the cap feedback. So this is what we already have. And now I want to connect here a switch capacitor equivalent for the resistor. So we can say this is the input, switch one, the capacitor, second switch and there we are. So this is the equivalent circuit. So we have another cap. I have to label them to, that we can distinguish them. This is then the C1. This is our C2. And we have to control the switches by different phases of a non-overlapping two-phase clock. So we can say this is the clock phase one and this is the clock phase two. Okay. You see that now the circuits become a little bit more complicated. So last week we had only this um, this part here, the resistor equivalent. Now we have an operational amplifier, we have this cap. So there is a need for a systematic way to analyze such a circuit. And the best thing to start is to label the polarity of all caps. So why is this? We have caps and we use switches to reconfigure the circuit, to connect the caps in another way. And the risk is that if we go from one phase to the other, that then by accident we reverse the cap in our calculations. And if this happens, then of course the result is, is completely wrong. So we have to remember which plate in the one half circuit corresponds to which plate in the other in the other phase. And therefore it makes sense to label, to simply label the caps in order to not reverse them accidentally. So I usually mark any plate of each capacitor by a plus sign, just to remember where, or just to give the cap a direction in the calculation. This plus sign does not mean that there is always a positive charge on this cap. So a common failure is 
that beginners make is to say, okay, where is, where is a positive charge on this cap? And this one is the one I label with a plus. So this is, this is the wrong way. Because I, you can imagine here, if we have a positive input voltage, then we have the positive charge on the upper plate. If there is a negative uh, input voltage, then it's the other way around. So the, for the calculation, this is irrelevant. So don't try to, to figure out which, which plate carries the, the positive plate. Just label them arbitrarily. But if you have them labeled once, then, then, then don't change it anymore. Because then you get, uh, you get a failure in, in your computation. So first step always to label the caps. Okay? No matter how, but keep your labeling. And the next stage, uh, or the next step is that we draw equivalent circuits. One corresponding to the first phase, one corresponding to the second phase. And by doing this, the circuit becomes much simpler and easier to analyze because then you don't have to, to think all the time, is it connected there or is it connected there? No, then all switches are gone. So let's, let's do this for, for this circuit. I will copy it uh, quickly. So here we have the switches. This was our C1 with the plus here. This was the second switch here. I guess it was here, yes. There we have the plus and this was the C2. This was phase one. This was phase two. Okay. Now we do this for the first clock phase, which we call phi 1. And during this time, the first switch is closed, so we have the cap C1 connected to the input. Here we have the input signal V1. This is our cap C1. And then the rest of the circuit is completely separated so here we have the amplifier with the feedback cap C2. And the direction is like this. Okay. Next step is we open this switch and we close this one. By opening this switch, we separate the cap from the input. So in the phase phi 2, we have the input voltage, V1, and this is connected to nothing. However, this cap C1 is now connected to the virtual ground of the amp. And this is our output signal, V2. Here I forgot it, there is also V2. Here's the ground, here's the ground. Here's our labeling, and this is the C2. Okay, now you have two equivalent circuits, but you got rid of the switches. So hopefully it looks a little bit simpler now. And this is exactly the second step that you should usually do. First step, labeling the plates. Second step, drawing equivalent circuits. So it is no secret that uh, during the last years we always had a switch capacitor um, question, a big switch capacitor question in the exam. So I guess, Michael, will, what do you think? I guess we all so will have one in the new exam. So it really makes sense to, to exercise uh, these circuits and to try to understand um, how this analysis is done. And this is safe points, okay? Drawing the equivalent circuits, I guess everybody should manage without uh, preparing too much, okay? And what I want is that you also exercise the next steps, which are not so much more complicated. So the next step is that we do a charge balance analysis.
This means that we go back one period in time and to start the analysis of the circuit phase by phase and during the different phases there is a charge transfer and this is what we have to calculate. So a common question is how far do I have to go back in time? Well, it's one complete switching period. So the, the switches are closed in a certain sequence, but the sequence itself is periodic. In this case, for instance, we close first switch, second switch, first switch, second switch. There might be more complicated circuits which have more than two phases. Then you have to go back more time steps. In our cases, usually we have two phases, so we go exactly one period back in time. So, stating that the, what we assume to be the current time step is n times t, going one time step back means that we go to the time t equal to n minus 1 times t. And in that phase, we have the phase phi 1. So, the first equivalent circuit is the valid one. Okay, let's analyze the circuit and compute all charges and voltages during that phase. So we can see here that the input is directly connected to this cap. So what we can state is that we have Vc1 is equal to V1 and the charge on this cap is Q1 at the time n minus 1 and this is equal to C1 times V1 at the time instance n minus 1. Okay. The output is a little bit more complicated. Here we see this voltage corresponds with this voltage loop to the voltage across the cap C2. So using this convention of saying this plate is the one I assume as positive, uh, as positive, then we can say we have a Q2 at this time instance n minus 1 which is equal to C2 V2 at the time instance n minus 1. So, and this is all we can state. Okay, at this time instance, we start the analysis. So, here we cannot compute charge transfer because it's the starting point. So, this is everything we can, we can state at this time instance. Then we go to the next time instance, which is one half clock later. And here we have T equal to N minus 1 over 2 times t and in this situation we enter the phase phi 2. Okay. In the phase phi 2 we have the input separated from the cap completely. The cap is connected to the virtual ground. So here we have a virtual ground which means that the voltage drop across this cap is zero. And the zero voltage drop means that the charge on the cap is zero. So obviously here we have a charge on the cap, here we don't have a charge on the cap. So what happens when we go from this phase to this phase, then the cap is discharged. So where is the charge going to? It cannot enter the op amp because no current can flow into the op-amp input, so the charge has to walk this way and is then used to store, or and is then stored on this second capacitor, C2. Okay, this is what, what happens in principle. Discharge this cap and move the charge to the second cap. And now we should formulate this in a mathematical way, so we can say the Q1 at the time instance n minus 1 over 2. This is equal to 0. 
This means that there is a change of charge on this cap which corresponds to delta Q1 which is equal to zero. Now we have zero and before we had this charge here. So we have zero minus C1 V1 at a time instance n minus one. So you see it's important that we take uh, all these time instances in our calculations into account because the, the values change during the analysis and so here we have to say this is this zero is valid at a time instance n minus one over two and before we had c1 v1 on this cap so this is equal to minus c1 v1 n minus 1. And this is delta Q that comes here, I forgot, here the positive sign, this is a delta Q that flows on this cap. A current is flowing that brings this delta Q to this cap. And if we look at this direction then the charge and the current comes from this cap so we have here the same amount of charge being moved. So we can say this is equal to the delta Q of the second cap. This is equal to delta Q2. And if we know what the, the change of charge on the second cap is, then we can say the charge on the second cap, the Q2 at the time instance n minus 1 over 2, This is then equal to the charge that we already had on this cap and this is the Q2 of the previous time instance n minus 1 plus the delta of charge, the charge transfer. So we have here plus the delta Q2. And if we insert this then we can say the Q2 n minus 1, this is what we already know from the first line, this is C2 V2 in time instance n minus 1 minus C1 V1 n minus 1. Okay. This is what, what I call the charge balance analysis. Okay, we start from a time instance, then we go to the next phase. In the next phase we can compute again the voltages independence of the terminals. And then we see if we comp look at the transition from one phase to the next one, we have to calculate which charge is flowing. And therewith we have to update all charges until we end up at the time instance n times t. So currently we are not at this time instance, we are at the time instance n minus 1 over 2. So we have to do this once more time to end up at the current time step. And this one is now t equal to n times t. So in this circuit this is an easy one. If we go back from this phase to this phase, then what happens is that we break this connection we connect the first cap again to the input. This is charged up again. But we break this connection. So there is no change of charge on the second cap. So what we can state here is that the Q2 at the time instance n is equal to the Q2 2 at the time instance n minus 1 over 2. Okay? And this, if we know the charge on the second cap, we can compute the voltage on the second cap, which is just by dividing by the cap. And we saw already that this voltage across the cap is equal to the output voltage. So 
sorry. So if I summarize this, then we can say the voltage at a time instance n is this term divided by C2. So we have here, this is equal, if I divide this by C2, then I have V2 at the time instance n minus 1 minus C1 over C2 times V1 also at the time instance n minus 1. This is what the circuit does described by a time domain equation. If you look at this equation, what do you think? Does this remember you to or something or have you already seen this equation in other courses? Or if not, can you imagine what it does while we are talking about integrators? So probably <laughs> it's something like this. But I guess you have already seen such an equation in, in a signal processing course. This is a discrete integrator which says the new signal is the old one plus an increment which depends on the input. Okay? So the output voltage is the old output voltage Okay, here is a minus, so it's an inverting integrator, but... Uh, so what? Okay. This, this is the integrator constant, and this is the input. This is this integration according to this explicit Euler method. Okay? This is a discrete integration that, that we use here. And for sure it has to be discrete because switch capacitor circuits is a discrete circuit technique that only emulates... Uh, continuous behavior. Okay, so what have we done so far? I put this in, in this cookbook. So the first thing was mark the polarity, easy. Second thing was to draw equivalent circuits, also easy. Third thing is to go back one period in time and go step by step towards the actual time instance and do this charge balance analysis. This is the most difficult step in analyzing switch capacitor circuits. And this needs uh, some exercising. So Michael will do this in the tutorials and yes, I already said it, I also want to encourage you to, to do this uh, on your own and really to understand what stands here in this cookbook and what is uh, hidden behind these steps. Okay. There is three more steps missing and this is what I want to do now. This is exactly what we also did uh, during the last lecture. First we derive a time domain equation. This is what we did so far. This is a time domain equation of the circuit behavior. And then we transfer this into the frequency domain and analyze it there. So again the same as last week we said the most appropriate transformation here is the C transformation because we have a discrete time uh, equation here. I copied this equation here and now we have to do the C transformation here you see it's a linear equation the coefficients here and the operator here simply remain the same in the frequency domain the only thing is here we have a time shift and this time shift is translated in the C to the in a C to the power of minus one. So what we can write here is simply V2 in the frequency domain is equal to C to the power of minus one V2 minus C1 over C2, C to the power of minus 1, V1. Okay, that's it. So now we have to sort this, bring all the V2s to one side, uh, leave the V1 on the other side, so we can say this is 1 minus C to the power of minus 1, V2 equal to minus C1 over C2, C to the power of minus 1, V1. 
and then we can compute the transfer function h c given by v2 in the frequency domain over the v1 in the frequency domain and this is simply equal to this constant minus c1 over c2 times c to the power of minus 1 over 1 minus c to the power of minus 1 and perhaps this is again something that looks familiar for you as a discrete time integrator so let's remove this and then the next step is to say okay now we have an equation in terms of c we want to compare this to a continuous time equation in terms of j omega so we have to evaluate here the frequency variable on the unit cycle so what we say is c to the power of minus one is equal to e to the power of minus j omega t equal to cosine omega t minus j sine omega t so no this one was too much okay and then we can say for small frequencies this is approximately equal to 1 minus j omega t so this is for small omega do you have a do you remember why I do this approximation for small omegas? Well, this is what we, what we discussed last week. We are emulating a continuous resistor by switching a cap to one, between two nodes. Okay? So, of course, this is not exactly the same because we, if you look detailed enough, we see the switching behavior. So a requirement is that the signal voltages change slow compared to the switching frequency. If the signals are changing completely during one switching cycle, then probably it won't work. So the requirement is the signal or the f relevant frequencies for the signal have to be much lower than the switching frequency in order to be the switch capacitor equivalent, a good representation of the circuit. So this is a reasonable uh, approximation here that is not only reasonable but it is a requirement for switch capacitor circuits that the switching frequency is high enough. And then if we insert here this C given by this expression then we end up in a transfer function H depending on J omega which is given by minus c1 over c2 so in the numerator I only have a c to the power of minus 1 so here I can more or less let me check what I did here Okay, now I, I made it even more exact, so we use this approximation only later. So we insert, remove this also, I need some more space. We have here H depending on J omega is equal to minus C1 over C2. e to the power of minus j omega t and here I have 1 minus e to the power of minus j omega t and this is a calculation trick that we also used uh, in our first lecture and I guess Michael used it also that we say okay we take the square root of this term and bring it bef in front of the complete term so what we say here this is equal to e to the power of minus j omega t over 2 
and then what remains is um, e to the power of plus j omega t minus e to the power of minus j omega t. And then we expand this by 2j, and this also by 2j. And then we can say this, sorry, here is over 2. And then we can say this corresponds to a sign, and this is a phase term that remains in the equation, and this term can then be cancelled by the root of this one. Okay? This is more or less a side calculation. And the result is that we have here minus C1 over C2, then we have a phase term exponential minus j omega t over 2. So when I was confused, I was wondering where this uh, factor of 2 comes, and, and this is exactly how it works. And here we have the 2j that we used for the expansion, and then we have sine omega t over 2. Okay, and then for small frequencies, the sign is more or less equivalent to its argument, and we can say what at the end we have minus C1 over C2, exponential minus 1 over 2 j omega t. This is a phase term that corresponds to a basic delay of half a clock cycle. And then, this is interesting here, we have j omega t. So this is our transfer function. And then let's think back to what we, what we had at the very beginning. Here we wanted to build an equivalent for the continuous time RC integrator. And here we have seen this is equal to 1 over j omega over omega 0, and the omega 0 was 1 over RC. And now we have a similar term, which is a prefactor, and then the phase term, and then 1 over j omega t. So if we compare this, then our omega 0, which was 1 over RC in the continuous case, is now given by this term and the t. So the omega 0 now corresponds to c1 over t times c2. Very interesting here is we again have only a ratio of caps, and we saw last week that the ratio of caps is always very robust because global variations apply to both caps in the same way, so to first order they cancel out uh, during the calculation. Just a Okay, sorry. Is there a question so far? Third step, and this is one we usually don't ask in the exam because it's more difficult to, to sketch this. The next step is to simply plot the transfer function in the body plot in order to understand what it actually does. And I did this for you, and you can see the blue line is what we expect from the continuous RC integrator. So it's a, it's a continuously falling behavior 
with this minus 20 dB per decade. The red one, which is the switch capacitor equivalent, corresponds very, very good to this blue one for small frequencies. And then, however, if we come to higher frequencies, so here we see the periodicity of the discrete time system, then, of course, there is a deviation. And if for very high signal frequencies, if we approach the switching frequency, then it is not a good equivalent anymore. So we have to design the circuit such that this region where we deviate from the curve that we want to implement is far enough away from all frequencies that we want to use. And if our frequencies of interest are somewhere here, if the switching frequency is high enough, then it's really perfectly working. And we have a switch capacitor equivalent that represents the function of the RC circuit. We can also analyze this in the time domain a little bit. So here I had or I have an example voltage here. And if you look in your lecture notes, then you see that the first cap is always connected to the input in the first phase and discharged in the second phase. So we can say in the first phase we charge the input cap to this voltage and we follow this voltage. And then it's like in the sample and hold circuit, which is better called a track and hold circuit, that as long as we connect the storage cap to the input, we follow the input voltage, then we turn this switch off here, so the signal remains constant here, the first cap is disconnected from the input, and then in the second phase here, if we go up here, then we discharge this cap because we connect it to the virtual ground, so we discharge it here, and then we are at zero. Then when we turn it on again, we charge it up, keep it constant, and here we discharge it again. Keep it constant, charge it up, and discharge it again. So while I'm drawing this as a design engineer, what do you think is the challenge in building this circuit, or the challenges. So of course you have already learned all these effects in the sample and hold circuits, what can happen here due to the switching, charge injection, clock field through, and, and, and. Of course, this is things that are also relevant for this kind of circuits because there also we have switches. So these effects in principle also occur in such circuits. But if you look at this, then we always have something which is charged up and charged down. So the requirement here is that you choose a certain switching frequency from a functional point of view. So taking this diagram into account that you say, okay, this effect here has to be far away from my frequencies of interest. Yes, this is one thing. And then you have to assure that your circuit is fast enough because here you always have somehow a time constant because it takes some time to charge the cap, it takes some time to discharge the cap. So this depends on the switch ca uh, resistances, this depends on the drivability and the dynamics of the amplifier that drives the input cap. Then for the second cap, it depends also on the dynamics of the amplifier that we have in our circuit. Okay. Then here we charge it up and discharge it, charge it up, discharge it. And of course the charge goes somewhere and here I draw the negative output voltage, negative because then the uh, polarity of the signal here and the one that I draw uh, fit better together. So we start with uh, any value of the integrator. And then, if this is discharged, we transfer this charge to 
to our cap so here we increase the value and during the phase phi 1 we keep this value constant then this is also a positive charge as this was a positive one so we go up again so what we do is to integrate up again and we keep it constant the next one is smaller but also positive so we go up a little bit the same happens here a little bit stop a little bit more and then the next one is negative so we go down and so on and so on so this is what how this integrator works okay here we we trend pump charge from the input to the storage cap and then depending on the polarity we go up or we go down exactly what a discrete integrator does okay what about parasitics well we already discussed about the problem of parasitics we saw that when we implement the cap then there is some nodes that is more susceptible to or that, that carry more parasitics than the other one and then we have seen that there are uh, nodes in a circuit that are more susceptible to parasitics than others and this is what we want to analyze here so we can say there is a parasitic cap with this cap so let's call this uh, CP1 here we have a parasitic cap C P2. There is one connected to this node. Let's draw it here. This is the C P three. And here we have a C P four. Okay. What about these caps? So the C P one is this critical or not? What do you think? It's critical, yes? Absolutely right. Why? Right, right. So what you say is that the C1 and the CP1 are parallel, so we cannot distinguish it during the operation. So this alters the, the value of the C1 and so we get different transfer behavior. So this has a direct impact and hence is a problem. So then pe people often say yes but it's, it's parallel to the cap that I want to implement so why is it bad? So I can make the, the C1 a little bit smaller. Well, the point is, parasitics is something that you cannot estimate very good. Okay, I can size a blade capacitor such that it has a certain cap. It is difficult to estimate all the, the caps of the wires co co connecting to this cap or the fringing cap at the, at the edges of, of this uh, blade capacitor and so on. And also there is tools to calculate this as I said last week, you know these parasitics at the very end of your design process. So when, um, when you are done with your design, when you have your layout and when you have to give uh, the design data to the technology guys, then you know your parasitics. But then it's too late to make uh, big changes. And hence it's important uh, to take these caps into account in an early stage and to try, always try to minimize them. Okay, what about the CP2? Problem or no problem? No, why? Yes, it's grounded on both sides. Okay, so this one is shorted. So this is, has definitely no impact. What about the CP3? So yes, also no, it's more or less the same. So this one is shorted. Between the ground and the virtual ground. Well, 
it's not that uncritical than the CP2 because in reality we always have amplifiers that do not have an infinite gain. So this contributes to the input cap of the amplifier and of course some charge that is transferred from this node and should be transferred to this node then it's also trapped on, on this parasitic so it's not that it's not absolutely uncritical because for a finite gain we also have some voltage swing here but if the gain is high enough we can can get rid of this okay finally the cp4 hmm? critical why it's it's a kind of low to the output well and as we have already some load connected here it only contributes to the load okay so it means that that we load the amplifier a little bit more so we have to to size the amplifier with enough margin to also drive this load but it has no impact on the signal transfer and so we can say this is also uncritical because it is only a load Okay, it's power, it requires enough drivability of the amp, but if there is a little bit more load or less load, your circuit should never be uh, designed so critical uh, that that this has, has an impact. So we can also say this is uh, negligible. So only additional load. Okay. Before I continue, I want to mention some, something else. So what we did so far is to say we start with an RC circuit and from this RC circuit we replace the Rs by one of the switch capacitor equivalents that we already had. So let's assume you have an amplifier like this, the inverting amplifier, very common, sorry, very common circuit in analog. You have two resistors configured around an op amp like this. Okay, so then you might say, well, two resistors, I have to do the replacement two times. So we can say we replace the first one by a switch cap equivalent. Then we have our amplifier. And then we replace this guy also by a switch cap equivalent okay what do you think about this i simply did the same step twice <coughs> Me? Why using two solutions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, what I try to do here is to say this one corresponds to this one, this one corresponds to this. But I guess Michael explained you at the beginning when we talked about the op amps what is important for an op amp to work in the linear mode of operation. Okay, in principle there's two, uh, two modes of operation. You can use the op amp as a comparator or as an amplifier. So what is important to use it as an amplifier, which means to use it in a linear mode of operation? Closed loop, yes. And what means closed loop? A feedback. As soon as there is no feedback, then the gain of the amplifier is that large that a small uh, 
really more or less negligible amount of voltage is sufficient to flip the output of the amplifier completely. So assume some millivolts at the input, then a gain of 10,000, and then, yes, your output saturates. This is a comparator mode of operation. If you look at this and say, okay, here we have a phi 1, phi 2, here we have a phi 1, for instance, phi 2, then due to the requirement that we have non-overlapping clock phases, there is never a feedback, okay? There is no feedback at any time. So this does simply not work. It is not allowed here to do this replacement, okay? So what we should learn here is a basic replacement of the resistors is not always possible. Okay, so it's a good way for me to explain how these circuits work. That I say, okay, look here, you have a continuous circuit, then we replace this, and that way we emulate the functionality of the continuous case, and this is the result, and as long as the switching frequency is high enough, it behaves the same. Yes. However, it is nothing that is uh, valid in general, that you say, simply remove all or replace all resistors by this. Okay, so basically an amplifier, as shown in the upper left corner, cannot be implemented like this. I will show you today another implementation of an amplifier, but please keep in mind, it's not possible to, in all cases, to simply replace this. And especially in, in closed loop circuits, be sure that the feedback is functional at any time. Otherwise, your circuit does not work in linear mode of operation. Your amplifier does not work. Okay. Let's come back to the integrators one more time. We have seen that the integrator that we had is susceptible to this parasitic capacitance, especially uh, at the, the, the top plate of the input cap. So here is two more implementations of integrators. And for these two circuits, I only will hand waving or in a hand waving way explain how they work. And I will leave it as an exercise for you guys to go through this circuit and, and to exercise the analysis of this. So in the first example, we again have an amplifier with a feedback cap. So this part acts as the integrating stage. And what happens here is that during a phase phi 2, we separate this input cap from the output stage and we discharge the cap by these switches. So we have at the beginning of each phi 1 phase always a discharged cap and then we close these two switches here and here and the current is flowing through this cap, charging this cap up also to the input voltage because we have a virtual ground here and then the current flows like this and charges this cap up. The result is that we have a transfer function and please exercise this given by minus C1 over C2 1 over 1 minus C2 to the power of minus 1. Okay, why is this insensitive to parasitics? Well, we have one here. This one is connected to the driving stage, to the input. So, s somewhere here is a driver and this driver has to charge this cap up and then it's discharged via the, during the phi 2 to ground. So, this has no input on the signal transfer. It is only a load to the driving stage. This cap here is connected to virtual ground or to the ground here. 
so it is also irrelevant. And then for the two caps here and here, the same arguments apply as on the previous slide, so we can neglect this. And now we have a situation where no cap is really critical for the operation of the circuit. If you look to the right, then you see a circuit which looks exactly the same, only the, the control of the switches is changed. Here we charge this cap up in a first phase like this, then we, there we charge it to the input voltage and in a second phase we connect the same cap between the ground and the virtual ground so it is discharged and the discharge current flows like this. Okay, so also the charge is transferred to the second cap and the result is that I have a HC equal to plus C1 over C2, C to the power of minus 1, 1 minus C to the power of minus 1. The interesting thing is that you can use the same circuit to achieve an integrating or non-integrating behavior which is good for, for reusing this circuit. You have to build it only once. You only have to exchange the control of the switches and then you get a plus or a minus sign. This, this means the sign of the transfer function can be changed more or less digitally by exchanging the control signals. All right. Yes, please. Sorry, sorry, can you speak louder? Yes. How C2 is charged in the second phase. Um, okay, let me remove this. So is it clear how it is charged? So in the first phase we close this switch, we close this switch, so we have here a voltage drop equal to V1. Okay? Good. This is clear. Then in the second phase we close this switch and we close this switch. Okay? So we have here a virtual ground, so the voltage drop here is zero. Okay? So it's the question how you how you calculated the way the time before. So if you say okay, this was the voltage in the first phase, then we have to use the same direction for the computation again, but now this is zero. There was a voltage on it, so now a charge compensating this voltage has to flow on this cap and then you can say if you count it like this then you can say this charge continues like this uh, yes by current like this and alters the charge on the second cap right exactly as soon as the voltage gets zero the charge has to be removed and you have to find the path where how where the charge is moved and the place where it is going to okay so it cannot enter here the op amp so the charge okay in a cap if you alter the charge your a current has to has to flow on both sides okay so the delta is here provided from the ground yes 
but here in, on the other side, it, it has to be moved. So it cannot enter the op amp, so it has to go this way. And alters the charge on the second cap. My recommendation is take half an hour of time and think th through this. This is this is quite important that you that you understand this, because this is an uh, important principle how these type of circuits work. Not only pure switch cap circuits, also some data converters r use the technique of of uh, shuffling data around uh, the circuit and to place it on different caps and to move it from one cap to the other. This is important to get a basic understanding of this principle and also get a feeling how it works, where the charge can go to. They say, okay, it's not, it cannot enter the, the ambit, then it has to go to the feedback branch and alters the charge on this cap there. Yes. Okay, other questions? Good. Then we discussed the switch capacitor amplifier, so we have uh, seen that we cannot implement an amplifier by simply replacing the caps. So here is a circuit that some people invented as a replacement or as a switch capacitor amplifier without the problem that we don't have a feedback. So you can analyze this with this cookbook approach. No, no problem. And you should also do this. However, we can see here that during the phase phi 1, we connect this cap to the input and we connect the second cap to the feedback branch. And during the phase phi 2, we have the virtual ground here and we have this switch connecting the first cap to ground so the first cap is discharged in the second phase. And the same holds for the second cap. This one is connected via this switch to ground and to virtual ground on the other side, so it is also discharged. And if you see this in, adv in advance, then you can say, okay, it's not necessarily to go back one complete period in time to n minus one times t. It's sufficient to start in the phase phi 2. However, if you don't see this, this is not a problem, then you start according to the cookbook approach at the time n minus 1 times t. Well, then you write down equations for this time step and then you see in the, in the intermediate time step n minus 1 over 2 times t, then both voltages are zero. Okay. It's somehow writing, but it's, it's no uh, big difference. Oh, it's no difference at all, okay? It's, it's the same result. So. so in the phase phi 2, we have both caps C1 and C2 discharged. And the op amp is reset. So what means op amp is reset? If you look at this circuit, then you see during this phase phi 2, this switch is closed, so we have a direct connection here. If I redraw the circuit like this, then you will immediately recognize what it is. Okay? This is a voltage follower, which copies the signal at this node to the output node. Okay? So now the circuit is configured in exactly that way. We have this feedback branch here. Well, the input node now is ground. So probably here at the output is also ground. So we have a fixed ground at the output which corresponds to a zero value and that's why people say the op amp is reset. Okay, nothing complicated. Okay, so everything in the quiet state during phase phi 1. So hopefully it's more interesting to analyze the phase phi 1. No, phi 2 is the quiet one, phi 1 is the interesting one. And here we can say 
Now we connect the cap to the input. Here we still have this virtual ground. So a current is flowing and charging up this cap. This one, this voltage is equal to V in. So and then exactly what, what you asked. Here the current that flows a charging current to charge up this cap. This one cannot enter here the amp. So it cannot enter this switch because it's open. So it goes up here, it goes up here, it goes on the second cap and places the same charge that went on the first cap also on the second one. So we can say we have a charge Q1 which is equal to C times V in. And if you say, okay, this is the counting direction for the second cap, then this cap is, or this charge is exactly the negative charge for the second cap. So this is equal to minus Q2, and Q2 is equal to C2 V out. So we can solve this and say V out over V in is given by this cap ratio minus C1 over C2. And you see it is also possible to implement an amplifier in switch capacitor technique. However, it does not look exactly like an amplifier in the, in the continuous case. Okay. Well, what about offset voltage in this context? Uh, Michael, have you used or uh, have you discussed offset voltage so far? For the basic amplifier. Okay. So one very common question in our exams is: uh, Here you have a circuit. Um, model the offset voltage of the operational amplifier, and then. Uh, I haven't understand why, but then strange things happen. Because uh, when I ask people to take an operational amplifier and to, to model the offset voltage, then some people make an offset voltage like this, or suddenly the offset voltage becomes an offset current or whatever. And the basic idea is to model the offset voltage by placing a voltage source in series to one of the input terminals. So in principle you can take one or the other, this is not a big deal, but you have to place it in series. Okay. So what I want to see then is that you place a voltage source like this. The direction is also irrelevant because the offset voltage is something that is usually caused by variation or by aging or is something undesirable and unpredictable. So it happens in one way. Okay? For instance, due to a uh, threshold voltage mismatch in the, in the differential pair. But hence you cannot say during the design it has this direction. It is only important that you model it here and then you can take it into account during your circuit analysis and can figure out whether the circuit is susceptible to this or not. Okay. Here we can say the offset voltage is modeled by a voltage source in this branch and I choose the direction like this. So we have a V offset here. So let me find, yes, it's a free slide. Here I put the offset voltage like this. So what is the input of uh, the impact of this voltage source? Does it disturb the operation of the circuit? What do you think? In principle, yes. Okay. So we, we, we have to uh, figure out how strong. So we start again with our phase phi 2. And then we can say here the voltage across this cap is now V1. Sorry, this is not a one, definitely not. V1 
is now equal to. Here we have this switch closed. Here we have this offset voltage source. So we have V1 equal to minus V offset. And the same for the voltage across the second cap. Here we can go this way. Here we are at ground. We come up here, have minus the offset voltage, have zero differential input voltage at the operational amplifier, and are back here. So this is our loop here. And we can say our V2 is equal to minus V offset. So without offset voltage, we saw that the input or that both caps should be discharged. Now they are not discharged. They are charged to the offset voltage of the amplifier. And so they carry also a charge and we can say the Q1 is equal to minus C1, the offset voltage, and the Q2 is equal to minus C2, the offset voltage. And then we go to the amplification phase, so phi1, this is the amplification phase. And here we connect this cap to the input. However, the voltage across the cap is now not only the input voltage, it is input voltage minus the offset voltage. The voltage drop here across the amp is again zero because we work in linear mode of operation. So we can say the V1 is equal to V in minus V offset. So the charge is Q1 equal to C1 V in minus C1 V offset. This is, we have a charge flowing onto the cap equal to delta Q given by C1 V in minus C1 V offset minus the value that we had before. So minus this. So this is plus C1 V O. And you can see these two terms cancel out, which is good. So we have a charge transfer that is independent of the offset voltage. But in principle, we are interested in the output signal, not in the charge transfer. So here it looks good, but it has more or less no, no value here. We ha are interested in the output voltage. So we have to compute this one. Therefore, we say the Q2 is now equal to the value that we had before, this one. So this is minus C2, V output, minus delta Q. Well, why minus? Because here we count it in this direction, the current flows up here. Here it's the opposite direction, so a minus comes into the play. So minus delta Q, so this is minus C2, V offset, minus C1, V in. And finally, we can say the output voltage here, V out, is given by the voltage across this cap, plus zero, differential input voltage of the amplifier, plus the offset voltage here. So the output is equal to one over C2 charge on the second cap, so Q2, plus V offset voltage. So this is, if we take this term and divide it by C2, then we have minus V offset, minus C1 over C2 times V in, and now finally plus 
V offset. And once again, you see the offset voltage cancels out and we end up with minus C1 over C2 V in. So we can say this guy is offset compensated. This is another very, very important property of switch capacitor circuits. Analyze your basic inverting uh, continuous time R-based amplifier into the offset voltage and you will see this offset voltage is there and disturbs actually your operation of the circuit. However, here in the switch capacitor circuits we use a technique which is sometimes called a correlated double sampling or error sampling or there's lots of different names for this which means we know that there is a non-ideal uh, effect in the circuit and then we do sample this and we do sample this for instance in the first phase here the offset voltage is stored on the two caps and then in the second phase in the actual uh, phase of interest then this previously sampled error is combined with the other signals in such a way that it cancels out. So why is it called correlated double sampling? Well, of course, the offset voltage has to be the same in the phase 2 and in the phase 1, otherwise it cannot cancel. And this is the case for the offset voltage because this is then more or less a constant that does not vary during the operation or vary only very, very, or change only very, very slowly. This is a technique that also applies to the low frequency component of noise. So there are circuits that use this technique also to cancel out noise. But of course only this applies only to low frequency components. The cancellation does not work if the if the signal or the disturbance, not the signal, the disturbance changes in between these two phases. Okay. One final comment to this circuit. Let's look at the signals here. Let's assume that we have an input signal given by the dashed line and we have these two phases here, a phi 1, a phi 2, a phi 1, phi 2, and so on. Okay. If you look at this, well, it's an in inverting amplifier. So, I apologize that I will ignore the minus because then it's easier to, to follow this line and to sketch, sketch it if I don't have to mirror it. So, in principle, what happens in the phase phi 1, we have an amplification. In the phase phi 2, we said we reset the operational amplifier to zero. Or in the case that we have an offset voltage, the output does not go to zero, but it goes to the offset voltage VO. So the circuit behaves like this. Then in the phase phi 1, we amplify again. Here we reset it, then we amplify again, and so on and so on. So, after a couple of hours mixed signal electronics, you should be concerned about a curve like this. What do you think about this one? At the beginning we said there is no ideal direct, there is no ideal step, there is always time constants. Some people say there is always a finite bandwidth. There is from coming out of amplifiers always a current limitation. A real operational amplifier cannot provide arbitrary amount of current. So Michael, I guess you know this very good <laughs> from your research topic. Um, so in reality, the signal looks much different. It looks like this. So here we start the amplification, then we, we start to charge the output. Then also the discharging, the resetting is not arbitrarily fast. So in reality, the signal looks more like this. And of course, this limits the speed of operation because we have 
large transients here always even if the signal does not change even if the signal is constant we charge it up then we reset it we charge it up we reset it and hence the speed of the circuit is limited and it would be desirable also with respect to disturbances to to get rid of this strongly switching behavior or to simply it would be desirable for instance to keep the output here constant during one phase and then in the next amplification phase we simply have to charge it up by the difference and there is indeed a circuit that can do this and this is the circuit I will use to begin the, the next lecture next week okay so if you have questions you can also use our forum but I saw nobody used it so far so either everything is, is clear or you are totally not interested in this stuff okay I wish you a nice week thanks for attending and have a good time. See you next Monday.